Well, we're in this series titled Revolutionary, and my, my hope, my prayer for every single one of you is that at some point along this series that you'll have a, well, a sudden, complete, marked change, that you will have a, well, a revolutionary moment. And across this series, we're looking at six different insights, truths from Jesus that will have the power to have a revolutionary moment within you. And part one, we, we looked at that you are accepted in a world that has mastered rejecting people and even at moments within the church rejecting people that, well, Jesus is like, no, 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 you are accepted, which led to number two, that you are forgiven. Yes, the things that you have done, the things that you wish you hadn't done, the things that you're thinking right now, just know that, well, we're all sinners and that the story of Jesus and the cross is about him taking on the sin of the world, your sin and my sin. And when that, when you place your faith, your trust in Jesus, that sin is wiped away. Well, that led to part three, that you are valued, that you are you are. And again, even in a world that screams you're not, and maybe you scream to yourself that you're not, you got to hold on to the fact that you are created in the image of God, that you are valued. And all three of these together, you are accepted, forgiven, valued, leads to this fourth one that you are important. And here's an amazing thought. The more you understand how accepted you are, forgiven you are, valued you are, the more you grasp that, the deeper that goes within you. Guess what? the more you understand how important you are to God's purpose and God's mission to tell all people that they're accepted, forgiven, valued. Well, where we're going to go, I I can't wait to get to. Here in a few moments, it's going to be encouraging and exciting. But, well, where we're going to start is a little less encouraging, a little less exciting. You see, the starting place, well, let's just start. Judgment. There's going to be a day and time where God will judge all people. And I don't know for you, maybe just hearing the word judgment, especially in the church context, I mean, is giving you, well, the chills right now, not the good chills either. Maybe your hands are getting a little sweaty, you're getting a little twitch going. Why? Because you think about back to, oh, that that moment as a child, hearing that preacher, that priest yelling and screaming about God's judgment. It may be for you every time you think about God's judgment, it's just wrapped in hellfire and brimstone. And that's your image. That's your picture of God as judge God. I don't want to, I don't want to minimize God as judge. His judgment is coming. God, a righteous, a holy, perfect God, will judge all humanity. But what I do want to encourage you with, instead of wrapping God's judgment with hellfire and brimstone, maybe, maybe you wrap it with something much different. You see, when I think about God as righteous, holy, just God, judge, you see, I wrap it with his love and his patience. The moment sin entered into this world, God set into motion his loving plan that included sending his son to this earth to crawl up onto a cross to take on the sin, your sin, my sin, to die. Why? Because he loves you. I think about God's plan the moment sin entered into this world. The amount of patience and self-control that God has pulled his judgment back. For thousands and thousands of years, God's master plan to draw all people to him to the point of sending his son to this earth. The amount of patience that God has right now, why his desires for all people to have the opportunity to place their faith or trust in his son, Jesus. You see, when I think about judgment, I think about God's love, and I think about his patience. Well, we're going to be looking at one parable found in Matthew chapter 25. And uh, what's interesting is in Matthew 25, there's actually three parables that Jesus tells, but we only have time for one. But in Matthew 24, it actually starts the teaching that leads into Matthew chapter 25. And, well, the teaching that Jesus does well, gets kick-started by a question that the disciples asked Jesus. It's a question that I'm sure many of you have asked before, maybe 
you're asking right now. And this was a question. When will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and, the, and of the end of the age? Right? H- haven't you asked that question? Like, when is the end coming? When is Jesus coming back? When is God going to just, uh, say, I'm done with this earth? Right? When? Isn't that a question? Maybe for you, you've watched YouTube videos about the end times. Maybe you've read books about the end times and there's mathematical formulas and lunar cycles and you think you kind of know when the end is going to be. Maybe you've sat with a friend that can quote the prophecies from, from Daniel into Revelation and tie it all together and all about the end times. And Well, this has been the question. 2,000 years ago, I mean, Jesus hadn't even died yet. And the disciples were going, hey, when's the end coming? It's a question that people are asking to this day. Well, after they ask the question, the first thing that Jesus says, I think is, well, it's kind of interesting and it's something that we can't dismiss. Immediately, Jesus, to this question, says, watch out that no one deceives you. I mean, that's right out of the gate. He goes, hey, people are going to. People are going to try to say they know. People are going to try to convince you. They're going to have their math formulas, and they're going to have you know, insights into and they're going to connect all these things. People are going to try to deceive you. Don't, don't let them deceive you. Don't, don't let them deceive you. Then Jesus goes, and he talks about, well, signs of the end of the age. And he goes, hey, the world's going to will be filled with division, betrayal, wars, persecution, false pro- prophets, and deception. And here's the thing. I mean, this was a list some 2,000 years ago, and, well, we can check all the boxes right now. And I hear people say, well, yeah, yeah, Chris, you know, don't, don't you think the end's, end's near? Because, look, I mean, look how bad the world is. And I always like to just kind of take a timeout. And I'd give you a timeout right now. Yeah, the world's bad. The world's filled with all of these things. But just glance back in history for a moment. Because the world has well, been really, really bad since sin entered into the world. I mean, I, I think about that small village that, well, the day Genghis Khan ca- came in and wiped out everyone. Uh, that was really, really bad. I think about the f- Jewish family living in Poland just decades ago. That was really, really bad. You see, what we like to do is we like to, well, look at our present day world and say, look, look, the end's near, the end's near, because look at all these things that's happening now. I'm like, yeah, just look over the course of history. This, this is what the world has been doing for thousands and thousands of years. It's been really, really bad, and it's really, really bad now, but it has been. But then Jesus, well, I want to highlight two things he says in Matthew chapter 24 that not only help us go where we're going to this day, that you are important, but maybe it will help answer the question, when? You see, Jesus actually directly answers that question. And this is what Jesus says. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only, only the Father. So if you watch a YouTube video and they say they know, they don't. If you read a book and the book has all the calculations in it and it says they know, they don't. If you sit with a friend and the friend goes, I know, I've been reading Daniel and the 70 week prophecies and revelations. I, I know, I know. No, they don't. I mean, Jesus couldn't have been any clearer. Like, no, not even the, f- I know. Only the Father knows. And think about Jesus saying that. I, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. And you might be wondering, well, how, if Jesus and God were one, how in the world did Jesus not know? Well, I encourage you just to go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. Paul does a masterful job well, just succinctly sharing about the relationship that Jesus chose to have with God the Father. That Jesus chose to be submissive to God the Father. He well, took on the very nature of a servant and he humbled himself, even death on the cross. You see, over and over again, we see Jesus when he was on this earth choosing to be submissive to God the Father. Plus, I think just Jesus knew that we couldn't handle the information. Like if we actually knew when, when the end was coming, we'd just stare at the clock until it was here. And that all leads to, well, why you are important. This is what Jesus said. Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom, the good news about well, God's plan 
for the world through Jesus will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. God, a loving, patient God, is waiting as long as he can for everyone to hear about Jesus. And that's why you are important. And then Jesus, well, he tells these three stories, these three parables, fictitious stories with a spiritual insight and a spiritual truth. And we're going to look at, well, this one, the sheep and the goats. Let's jump in. When the Son of Man, and that title is one of Jesus' most favorite titles for himself. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, meaning resurrected King Jesus. John writes such a beautiful description using earthly words, earthly framework for what he was seeing kind of in the divine realm. In Revelation chapter 1, this picture of well, the eternal King Jesus coming back in all of his glory. You should, you should read it. He says, hey, when he comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. This is the judgment throne. And then he says all the nations, this is all people, all people around the world, will be gathered before him. And well, he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he said, well, the sheep, well, the sheep will be put on the right, and the right was kind of the favored position. And he said, the goats, well, the goats will be put on the left. Now, what we have to understand is, well, 2,000 years ago when Jesus was sharing this parable, everyone understood just, well, the life of a shepherd and the difference between sheep and goats. You see, from a distance, sheep and goats look very similar. I mean, if you just looked at all of them in the field, you really couldn't tell the difference between the two. But they had, well, they were very different. You see, a goat's wool was a lot more coarse. And so sheep's wool actually fetched a, a much bigger price. And how you cared for sheep and goats were completely different. Goats hated cold weather. And so at the end of the day, shepherds would have this big, long wooden chute, and they would bring all the sheep into it one by one and the shepherd would sit at the end and there'd be a gate and the shepherd, shepherd would sit up on top and as they c came close, he would move the, the sheep into one pen and the goats into another. And this is the image that Jesus is painting. And he said, well, the king, the king, and this is the only time Jesus actually referred to himself as a king. So Jesus is taking this, well, this, this parable, this fictitious story about a shepherd, and now he's inserting the king. And for the Jewish audience, this would have got their attention. You see, King David was a shepherd that became king, and that the Messiah would come from that lineage. And so everyone would have been leaning in to, well, this parable as Jesus brings in the illustration of a shepherd and a king. And he said the king would look to his right and he would say, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, a kingdom prepared for you and since the creation of the world, from the beginning of time. Hey, here you go. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And think about the story. I mean, the king said, well, well, I was hungry and thirsty and I was a stranger and I needed clothes and I was sick and I was in prison. It's like, well, no, no king, no king would have those needs. And the righteous, the righteous. Now, this was a jab to the Jewish religious leaders and, well, the Jewish people that thought righteousness was all external. You see, what was going on, and this is a danger for all of us to this day, is what was going on is if you acted righteous on the outside, externally, right, then you checked all the boxes. And what Jesus is going to do is, will redefine what righteousness really looks at, like. It's not about how externally you act or the boxes you checked. Oh, it's so much, so much different. And Jesus said the righteous, the real righteous, the true 
righteous people that are right before God, the righteous. Well, they will answer, hey, 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 Lord, when? Because they, they understand this picture. The king? When, when did we see, when did we see you hungry? When, when did we see you thirsty? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you needing clothes? When did we see you sick? When did we see you in prison? Like, hey, you're the king. You're provided for. You have no needs. When? And the king will reply. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, someone with great need, someone at the opposite end of the spectrum from a king, brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then the king will turn to the left and say, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And the king will say to those on the left, I was hungry and you didn't feed me and I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a, a stranger and you didn't invite me in. I, I needed clothes and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and nope, you weren't there for me. I was in prison. Nope, you didn't come visit me. You didn't help me at all. And well, they will reply. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then Jesus, he brings this story to a, not so comfortable clothes. And he said, then they'll go away to eternal punishment, judgment. But the righteous to eternal life. Now there's something we gotta be very, very careful with. Because there's something that it'd be easy for you hearing this story to start thinking about. It'd be easy for you to say, so do you have to earn your way to eternity? Is that what Jesus was teaching? Like, okay, if I, if I find someone who's hungry, give them food. If I see someone thirsting, give them water. If I see a stranger, I invite them in. If I see someone who needs clothes, I give them clothing. If I see someone sick and I help them. If, I, if someone's in prison, I go visit them. If I do those things, and then okay, then I get an eternal life. And Jesus in no way was saying you earn your way. What Jesus is saying is this, is there's evidence of your faith connected to Jesus. That how people will know that you are a Christ follower isn't by all these external check marks that you just put on a good show. That people will know that you are a Jesus follower by how you it's like we say at TCC, how we love first. You see, I think about, I think about this list. And was Jesus like, hey, is this going to be evident? That when you, when you become a Jesus follower, it's just going to, well, it's just going to leak through you. It's going to leak on everyone else. That the love of Jesus within you it's going to drive you. It's going to be evident for you to care for people, the least of these and everyone else. You see, the more you understand that you are accepted and that you're forgiven and that you are valued, the more you understand that for you, the more you understand God's heart for everyone. And what Jesus is saying is, guess what? Remember, the end of the age won't come until Everyone hears about Jesus. And Jesus talked about this. The greatest way for people to lean into him is how? By how you love. It's how you serve. It's how you treat everyone. And this gets to something I'm so excited about to share. 
You see, there's one thing I love about all of our churches, filled with people that aren't trying to earn their way to heaven because they know they can't. But living passionately a life, a life reflecting Jesus' love, reflecting a life of how Jesus lived, reflecting the life of how Jesus led, reflecting a life to say, you know what, Let, let's do this. And I wanted to share with all of you what, what's happening within our churches. And well, I want to invite you just to be a part. And just maybe, just maybe, as I share in the next few moments, that there's, well, maybe there's going to be a sudden, complete, marked change, a revolutionary moment for you. You see, we have two, two massive components of our impact strategy, uh, our global impact and our local impact. And it's just well, it's like it sounds. Our local impact is in all of our communities that we have churches in and the surrounding communities. How are we going to help serve, put love into action in every one of our communities? Our global impact is, well, everywhere else. And I'm not going to show, share with you an exhaustive list of everything we're doing, but I do want to highlight a couple of well, really exciting things that are happening right now that maybe you want to join us with. Attached to TCC, we have a nonprofit. It's called, well, it's called Square One Community. And the heart of Square One Community is helping people to go from surviving to thriving. We want to help people that want to, well, kind of get up on their feet and take a new direction in their life. People that maybe have made some bad decisions or life has just been really difficult for them, and we want to come beside them to, well, to help them go from surviving to thriving. And as we've been pursuing that end to say, how can we do this, we'll do this more and scale it. We knew as a church we needed another arm to, for us so we can connect with more organizations. You see, Square One is a nonprofit. Well, it's able to get into some areas that maybe a church can't. And it's already proving that it can in such a powerful way. One of the things we, we launched is something we call House to Home. And House to Home is, well, it's, it's taking that vision and helping people go from surviving to thriving and just taking that vision and, and just wrapping it. You see, House to Home is all about, well, Generous people like you donating gently used home items. And we resell it at a discount to people to help them. But you see, that's only step one of house to home. That's, that's not the only thing we're doing. You see, what we're, what, what we're passionate about is what are the real needs in people's lives and how do we meet those needs? And one of the things we discovered is there's people in our local communities that desperately need mattresses. And so we have some great business partners that are helping us with that. And we've been giving away mattresses over the last about three months. As of right now, we've given away 44 mattresses. And I, I think that number is significant because we're just getting started. And so some of the proceeds from House of Home helps us to buy more mattresses so we can give more mattresses to people. And we're already getting phone calls from other nonprofits that hear about us. And they're like, hey, I have a veteran that needs a mattress. Can you help us out? And we say, yes. We have an elderly uh, couple that needed mattresses. And we got a call from another nonprofit. Like, we can help. Well, we received a call one day from an older lady that her mom was moving into an another care facility and didn't have a bed. And she was like, I, I don't have the money for a bed. And we're like, we got a bed for you. And the stories keep going and keep going. And again, we've just been at this a few months. And already this year alone, we've given away 44 mattresses. And we're just getting started. Another layer to house to home is our business partners. And maybe, maybe this is something for you. You're a business owner. You're a business Leader, And you see, I, I'm so thrilled that we're partnered with Miller Home. Pam Miller, the, the owner of Miller Home, her, her heart beats to help people in local communities to go from surviving to thriving. And so she came to us and she was like, hey, can we give mattresses away? And part of her business to help donate mattresses to House of Home so that we can give it away. She's financially, through Miller Home, helping Square One launch more and more House of Homes across all of our communities because what we want to do is put one in every community that we have a church at right now and future communities that we want to launch more churches. And so she's leveraging her business to help impact the lives of people. And so if you're a business leader, a business owner, I just want to say, why don't you partner with us. 
It's so exciting. Again, I feel like we're just getting started and so many people are already being helped. In fact, if you are a business leader, I would just ask you, drop me an email at chris at sq1.community and um, just let's start a conversation. There's another business leader. His name is Tim Britton. Tim owns Clearfield Metal Technologies and he reached out to me and his passion again is to leverage his business to help people. And one of those things is helping people who maybe took the wrong turn in life and uh, they just can't, well, no one else will hire him, them. And Tim's like, I want to create a pathway where we can take people. Maybe they're just getting out of prison, getting out of jail. Maybe they're getting out of rehab. No one else will hire him. He goes, I'm willing to take the risk to help people because I believe in the mission of helping people go from surviving to thriving. So Tim and, and myself with Square One and Clearfield Metal Technologies, we're just, again, we're at the very beginning just trying to figure this out. But what I appreciate is, again, business leaders that realize they can leverage their business to impact the lives of people. Is that you? Maybe you have an idea right now. Again, message me. Maybe for you right now, you're, you, don't, you, don't, you don't know how. Message me. We can figure it out together. Maybe for you as a business, you just want to give financially so we can give more mattresses to people. Join us. It's happening every week. Lives are being changed. Another thing I'm really excited about is what we're calling lifelines. And lifelines, one of the things we realize is, well, throughout COVID, there's a, there's a mental health wave that was already here, but it's gaining steam as, well, it's been such a difficult year. Laurel Carell, who is our campus pastor up at our Ridgeway uh, campus, is months ago came to me and she had this old burden that got to put onto her heart. It's like, hey, how, how do we help people in our local communities that find themselves, well, kind of at the crossroads? Whether that's maybe it's an addiction, maybe they just lost a job, maybe it's depression. I mean, you whatever goes on that list. I mean, there's so many needs, and they just don't know where to go. She goes, how can we do something to help people and connect them with someone to help them? How do we throw a lifeline to people who are at that point in life? And I looked at Laurel and said, Laurel, let's, let's run with it, and she has. So this weekend, we're officially launching Lifelines. And Lifelines is a partnership, again, with TCC and Square One Community because we want this for all people. Already, we have over eight life coaches that are going to be just available when someone messages us and says, hey, I just need help for them to be there to help them get to the help they need. You can simply... Text 8337090962 the word lifeline and uh, we'll just send you we'll send you that link. But here's what I'm excited about it. Within all of our smaller towns, there's not a lot of resources. But we as a church, we as a nonprofit square one community, we can do something about it. And maybe God's stirring on you to be a life coach, maybe God's stirring on you to well, maybe there's another vision. Because I think about, well, I think about our team moms. Incredible women that are helping mentor and care and love for young moms. I think about Celebrate Recovery, a space that's created for people that, well, they've hit a roadblock in life. And a group of people helping them navigate life together. You see, there's so many different opportunities for you to be a part of, well, us helping people. And guess what? We all need, we all need, we all need help at times in life, don't we? Well, that all gets to our global impact partners. I mean, we have global impact. We have, uh, we're supporting a church up in Boston, and we are also helping Campus Crusade in the, in the State College area. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to highlight is, well, Compassion International. And right before COVID, we had really kind of narrowed in on a country, Ecuador. And we just said, we just want to sponsor every child we can in this one region of Ecuador. And uh, why do we want to do that? Well, we want to make a significant change in that one region. And then eventually, once things open up again, we want to start well, taking trips to that uh, area in Ecuador so that, well, you can visit the child and the family you're supporting. And so right now, uh, if you just send a text to 
six two the text the word sponsor. We'll send you that link. You can also go to compassion.com slash TCC and uh, sponsor a child or two. Again, we can, we can do something to make an impact in people's lives. And again, just know that as soon as we can, we're going to start taking global impact trips to Ecuador so we can just pour our resources and our love into that local community. And in fact, you know, my prayer is that for some of you, you're going to be on that trip, being able to meet the child that you've sponsored and build a relationship with them. I don't know. This is just a snapshot. What do you need to do to join God with what he is doing? Remember that you are important you are and God wants to leverage your life to intersect with someone else's life to put love into action so let's do this together and let's impact as many lives as we can let's pray Lord I'm thankful for who you are and what you're doing And Lord, I just pray that our churches take this call seriously. That we'll leverage all of ourselves to join you in what you are doing, to put love into action. To help people, all people. People like us, people not like us. That we'll be a church who loves first. In your name I pray, amen.